welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're here with Donal O'Neill, uh, the producer of Serial Killers, Run on Fat and the Big Fat Fix, and recently our production of Extra Time. So great to see you, Donal, in South Africa there, aren't you? Great to see you, Ivor. And uh, my first question is to you. This is your first role as a producer of a movie, so this wouldn't have happened without you, as you well know. Um, it's been quite the journey, so why don't you tell your avid listeners and viewers, how was your first experience producing a movie? Oh, well, it was very easy for me because you were involved, obviously. I just turned up. But, uh, yeah, no, it was really interesting, and it was great to see the whole way that a movie is produced and the timelines managed and you know what fascinated me about it was as you described very early on you don't know the arc of where the movie will go so this was a very open-ended movie it could go anywhere we were testing 45 men we didn't know what results we get i remember thinking at the start if we get very few scores it'll be kind of weird because what do we make of that um, and then also the efforts of people to address the high scores would they be successful? Would they make enough effort? There's so many open-ended things. So you just got to keep shooting and keep shooting and build the material and change direction. So it was really program and project management, which I was used to in my previous life. Um, and it was, yeah, no, it was a great experience. Obviously, I was only limited involvement uh, here and there, but I certainly got a good feel for the whole challenge uh, with, with actually making a movie, movie, I think people see the finished movie and it's slick and smooth and it's all choreographed almost and it flows so well and the story arc and they kind of think, ah, oh, well, the guys got together for a month or two and, and just shot this thing, but they have no idea uh, of 18 months travel, repeated shoots, just so much work that goes into it that people just won't perceive when they watch it. So, uh, a great experience and of course IHDA David Bobbitt being able to help support it uh, also the reason it really happened I think you were going to make a, a movie about the GAA but a much smaller scope and scale and it, and it became obviously much much bigger yeah well it, this was actually as you know my uh, third time lucky on this one we had originally tried to get the concept off the ground with the uh, 1995 South African Rugby World Cup winning team here uh, down in Cape Town. And I couldn't get a budget to do that. But um, after that, we then uh, tried Australia. And same thing, couldn't really get to grips with it. And then it was, it was when Paddy O'Rourke, the, the down winning captain from the 1991 All-Ireland Football Final, contacted me. Uh, I know Paddy personally. He just uh, wanted to grab a coffee and tell me he loved what we were doing and is there anything he could help with. His son's a fantastic strength and conditioning coach and very interested in this space. And that's a number of years back now. And I pitched it to Paddy and he said, I'll, I'll help you make that happen. And of course, little did we know that, um, you know, when I hit DA and, and, and David got involved through your, your good self, that this would become uh, an Irish production. And I guess, you know, what you've said earlier there would scare the life out of any filmmakers watching this because in all the movies I've done, um, the arc kind of presents itself as you shoot. It's a very, very, very risky thing to do. Um, but in the space we're in, where you're trying to intervene and impact people's health uh, over a period of time, you've got to go with it. And if you don't get the result, well, that's on, in this case, it would have been on you and I for not having done our research and not having been on top of what's what. So th there's always a bit of a punt involved and that makes it much more exciting. But this was far and away the most challenging project that I've ever done. And as I said in the movie, you know, when those results were coming in at the end, I was more nervous than I was about any results I've had done myself during the years. So it was, um, it was great to be able to bring it home. And uh, thanks again for helping me make it happen. Oh, not at all. And it's a great message to get out there, which was the whole idea that people could just understand. You can find out your level of disease, your level of risk. And crucially, the second part, you can address it. There's no magic in this space. I mean, it was great that we got, I think, three or four cardiologists involved, uh, a couple directly in the movie. And then, of course, uh, Dr. William Davis and Dr. Ross Walker. 
and others uh, through the interviews online to give good science-based feedback and uh, clinical experience on what actually can mitigate the disease process. So again, there's no magic. There's just a series of vitamins, minerals, you know, proper dietary uh, regimes, which just kind of remove the root causes that are driving the disease forward. So uh, I think the other great thing was Scott, uh, Dr. Scott Murray, cardiologist, and for people's awareness, he's a research cardiologist who's been fixated with atherosclerosis for decades, who has published multiple papers with advanced ultrasound intravenous uh, studies on humans. So our cardio on board actually is a research cardiologist, which is great. But as he said at the end, and, and it resonated with me, you know, in the next 10 years, what we've seen in this movie and what we're aware of outside of this movie, uh, cardiology is going to have to change and start embracing a more root cause resolution approach and yet yeah, there'll still be the meds and certainly the uh, interventional operations to save lives that'll all stay as it is but to start adding the diet lifestyle nutrition elements which will cause a much bigger drop in heart disease than than nearly anything we've done in the past few decades yeah well this is it and i think the most exciting thing for me personally has been um i think scott's involvement and as you say as a as a leading researcher in the field, for a movie to present a, a meaningful impact in that space, um, you know, we could see how excited Scott was at, at, at the results. And, you know, it, it's, it's anecdotal, but we're, we're seeing more and more anecdotes. So it's fantastic that, you know, these people in, in a position to conduct the real clinical research and, and really drill down into some significant data over the next number of years are interested. And, and that's, a, that's a huge step forward. Whatever about people watching the movie and, you know, how many viewers you get and this type of thing, that's a huge achievement in itself. And, you know, it's, it's I think, down to, you know, the, the journey that, that we all took with Patty. And, and uh, it's, you know, probably one of the most um, significant achievements that, that I've had in the last number of years with any project. So I'm delighted about that. Excellent. And I love the way as well you tightened it in the end because all of that editing and finalizing was kind of out of my sight, but it's tightened to around an hour, which is is enough for for a story to be told. You know, it's not a feature entertainment movie, a classic Hollywood, which might run 90 minutes. So I, I think it works really well. And the challenge is you, of course, the big challenge was you don't know where the story arc's going to go. So that's calculated risk taking. But there were some other challenges too that we we've talked on before. Maybe we could run through some of those. Yeah, I mean, people will ask. You know, obviously, when we when we ran through the tests, you could see that down. And you did the voiceover on that with the results. You know, the down team had some very high scores, and the question might be, well, what happened to the rest of those boys? And you know, there's eight, eight of them went to see a, a cardiologist. They were given stress tests and echoes and whatnot. And one of the players, uh, you know, it, it was um, estimated that he had a 70% chance of a heart event within the next 12 months. He actually did suffer uh, a heart event and has since undergone bypass surgery. But again, that had not been picked up in his regular checkups with his own doctor. And that story isn't told because A, you don't have time and B, um, you know, to do that in the context of a movie is a movie in itself. So you, you, you don't have time in the, in the 30 minutes we had after the, the team results to chase down everybody who got a result. You know, Paddy had said to me that, that uh, he, was, he was up for this and he wanted to meet it head on. And that's interesting. And the results give hope and inspiration to people who are in a similar position. But to, and you've now seen the filmmaking process, so you can imagine trying to cover the lives of eight different people. Not everybody's comfortable on camera. Um, you know, not everybody wants to do much apart from possibly take some medication and, and do a bit more exercise, which we know isn't even particularly helpful, but not everybody gets the message. And the objective in this movie was to, to show that you may have underlying disease that you're completely unaware of, and it looks like there are things you can do to impact that. And, and we're only at the, 
I think at the start of that learning curve, so when Scott and his colleagues really get into the research over the next number of years, as you rightly point out, I think 10 years from now, we'll be looking at a very different landscape in how the preventive cardiologists and hopefully even interventional cardiologists uh, view heart disease as an illness. Yeah, and even in the, in that case there, in fairness, the heads up with the high score that the gentleman got uh, enabled plans to be put in place for a bypass. So it was quite striking that just while the operation was being waited for, that an actual event occurred. But it it ended up fine, bypass done, guys in great shape, I believe. And uh, it, it further strengthens the message. But I agree, uh, having seen the filming making process, uh, by the time that event occurred, I mean, literally tiny changes to, to the finished product, you know, uh, would have been very difficult. Uh, never mind all the, all the challenges you mentioned. So that's for sure. And, and there were other, other things occurred as well that were very striking during uh, the making of the movie. Yeah, well, the, the darkest cloud for me, as you know, mm. was uh, the passing of Eamon Burns, who we, we meet in the movie. And Eamon was um, uh, an absolute Trojan for, for down football over the years. And uh, he, he passed away very unexpectedly. And uh, you know, his wife sent me a lovely message to, to thank us for keeping him in the movie and in amongst his teammates with a smile on his face. Because as you know, our tests didn't show up anything. Eamon was very close to a, a contender for man of the match, but um, his particular issue appears to have been genetic. The, the men in his family um, haven't lived to see 60, and he told us that in the course of, of our interview. So it was very, very poignant, but um, you know, his issue was electrical. And as Scott you know, sat me down at that stage when I was questioning everything, and, and he pointed out, he said, listen, you know, when, you get it, when you're a male in your 50s, you know, there is no such thing as zero risk. And uh, that's, that's the reality. We, we all suffer from the condition that, that is humanity. And when, as you know, we, we'd finished the, the, the sort of second to final cut of the movie at that point, and it, it was devastating. And we were concurrently getting news that day about uh, the player who went on to have the, the bypass. So that was a very, very dark day because, um, you know, I, I know a lot of these people personally. and They've been heroes to me as a kid and I've played and lived and worked amongst uh, some of them down the years. So that was very, very difficult indeed. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, just it's important that people understand that Eamon Burns was, was doing everything right. And, you know, sometimes it's just not fair. And sometimes it's something else. And, you know, you've said that to me. You, you, you love looking at the data. And, you know, uh, I think I mentioned to you a while back about a buddy of mine who just turned 50 and a few issues, even though the heart was fine. And you said, ah, yeah, but sure. The numbers start to work against you when you get up into, into middle age. And, and, and that's the, the sad reality. But um, nobody should think that, uh, you know, Eamon, Eamon leaving us was, was uh, a missed opportunity because that was my initial thought. Um, but, you know, Scott has, has reassured me and explained what else can happen. And, uh, you know, unless you're an expert in the field of cardiology, it's hard to accept that you've done what appeared to be comprehensive heart scans and you don't find something. My fear was that we'd left something behind. Um, but I'm now reassured that... Uh, we did our very best, and you know, as as a cousin of mine who's a urologist said, you know, don't you're scanning 45, 48 middle aged men who are asymptomatic. He said something's going to happen, and that struck me because I, I I've been used to making movies with, you know, one, two, three individuals involved. You can control the scenario, but this was very, very different. And then when when things started to, let's be honest, un, unravel in terms of some of the results. Um, it, uh, on the one hand, you might say it, it, it makes for an interesting journey for the viewer, but it, it was not particularly comfortable at the time. But I, I think and I hope that the, the end product and the messaging is, is quite strong. And uh, let's see how, it's, how it resonates out there. And let's see if some other sporting codes around the world, we've got some initial interest, are willing to look at the format and maybe you see it happen in rugby, soccer, Aussie rules, American football. That's how you carry a message to middle-aged men because if we can get them to even just a small percentage of them to change their lifestyle, we know that uh, the implications are enormous for many individuals and many families. That's really the end goal. You can only do your best. 
Yeah, absolutely, Donald. And of course, that is the goal is saving lives. So it is very difficult. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't know the guys personally like you did, but I was there for it. It's extremely difficult when you have medical uh, potentially life altering scenarios and you're engaged in it right in the middle. That's why I was delighted we had multiple cardiologists involved because it really is their expertise, as you say. And I remember I was not 10 feet from where I am now when I got that phone call from you. And I just, whoa, I was just, well, obviously greatly saddened, but also shocked, just like you were. Uh, my instinct was, knowing that there wasn't a high score, uh, absolutely that perhaps an electrical problem of, of some nature. Uh, it's still possible with a zero score, though. It's important for people to know. You could have one very large soft plaque in an area of your arter arterial tree, uh, where there's a weakness, sometimes genetic, where you could get a very fast growing plaque, not yet calcified, and it could cause a catastrophic event. So that's why we stressed zero score around one point something percent chance of a heart attack in the next 10 years, very high score, maybe 15 or 20 percent chance. But, but note that a zero score right now today does not guarantee uh, but it looks like, as, as you said, it turned out with time that, yes, it was a kind of medical history there with a previous operation, maybe, and, and a special kind of cause as it happens. But the message is key. Most heart attacks are atherosclerosis, the process we talk about, and most are reflected very faithfully in risk by the calcium score. And like you said, if only a small percentage of people actually took action in the right vectors you'd make an enormous difference in the world so let let's see what happens and let's see how much people can support in getting this movie out there and and letting people know how it kind of really works exactly and i think it's always important to uh, to temper people's expectations i mean there are people as you well know in our sphere who they project this perception that they're going to live forever and it's xyz that's complete nonsense. I mean, you have to be realistic about these things. And what we are trying to do is to improve people's metabolic health. And that sets you up, you know, in better stead to meet things like the, the COVID pandemic we're seeing at the moment. It's just a better place to be. But you're not going to live 30 years longer. I mean, you're hopefully going to extend the, you know, the, the time you have on Earth that is healthy and enjoyable. But longevity and, and these guys that are pushing out to suggest that they're going to live to 120, 150. I don't believe we're anywhere near that yet. Um, I'm, I'm happy just to contribute what I can to help people get up, feel a bit better in the morning, and perform a little bit better for as long as they can. And, and it's, it's no more simple or complex than that for me. Well, you know what, Donald? Uh, it's eight years ago now when I first started researching this field, and it didn't take long to figure out the basics, to be quite honest. But I remember telling a guy I worked with, a good friend of mine, who's very technical. Uh, he's mostly managerial, but highly technical too. And I explained to him that essentially, if in middle age you've got metabolic disease or diabetes in situ, that the majority of adult Americans have now, essentially. Uh, and we're not sure in Europe, but not too far behind. If you take the right steps to address those root causes, I guessed at the time, based on the numbers, you might add seven, eight, nine years to your life compared to continuing to eat the bad stuff, be malnourished, and drive the disease processes of modernity. So maybe seven or eight, nine, ten years, which is a lot. That was my shot. But the last 20 or 30 years of your life are going to be way higher quality also. So quality adjusted life years, because I saw when you fix the root causes broadly, your mental acuity improves, your weight drops, your hypertension drops, your, your, your physical well-being increases so much. So you've lowered your risk, you've extended your life by X, but the next 20, 30 years are all going to be higher quality. So the prize is huge and it really resonated with him because he likes the bottom line numbers. And he just thought, wow, just fix what we now know are the broad, big causes in your diet, nutrition, lifestyle, and you can get that kind of change. That's a big prize, right? The return on investment is tremendous, and we know this. And I always say to you know, my mates, I mean, like, how much do you spend on your car? 
how much time do you spend selecting your car, you know, the body work, the engine, the seats, the this, the that. And I'd say, well, if, if your body was a second-hand car, would you buy it right now? And that, that's always a good test for any, any, any of the boys I like, to, I like to put out to them. And, um, yeah, as you said, the, the steps are relatively straightforward. Um, we, we've looked at them through the course of the, the movies and the books. And, you know, I think we're all singing the same song. And uh, I like to think of the movies, the books, everything you've done, everyone else in the field, that uh, it's like coffee shops. Uh, you know, we need a cluster of this information and people can select, you know, which which channel, which mechanism, audio, visual, whatever, written, whatever reaches them, um, as long as it reaches them, that's the important thing. So hopefully extra time will uh, we'll touch a few more people and we'll see some um, information coming back from, from viewers that have taken on board what they've seen in the movie and, and got some very positive results. Yeah, and you can keep that Ferrari in good shape there, Donald, while I keep my kind of reasonable condition old Ford pickup uh kind of together hopefully <laughs> well unfortunately uh independent filmmakers you won't find too many of them apart from michael murray driving ferraris perhaps but uh we'll, we'll, we'll keep going because to me the the message and, and retaining editorial control of what we do is is, is much more important than um oh. you know trying to eke out the, the greatest return on a movie yeah. and that's oh. that's how we we'll continue to work for sure don i actually meant the body <laughs> you got the Ferrari, I got the old Ford pickup, <laughs> but yeah. Well, I, so, I don't have a zero score. You don't have a zero score, which which actually is, a, 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 that's a great point, the illustration that we had Paddy looking great. Uh, my wife Eilish actually said, didn't he look fantastic and yet a huge score? You have a moderate score. So that's another huge point. It, it it's You can never tell by looking and even the blood tests are very, very ambiguous. You know, I was talking to Arthur Agatston in the last few days, uh, a few times we've been talking about heart prevention and that, um, and he just kept making the point, you only know when you do the calcium scan. And we were just agreeing with each other to the point of laughing about it almost. It was so funny because he has got hundreds, thousands of patients over 35 years and he's an absolute ace at using blood tests and insulin tests and all kinds of tests to assess risk. But there's a huge proportion at the end of the day that he can only tell the real scenario with a calcium scan. And then he can take the extra actions with those patients as required. But it's the arbiter. It's the only thing that truly tells your degree of arterial disease. It's so important. Well, I, I, as you know, while we were filming, I found out that an old uncle of mine had a score in excess of 4,000. That's on my mother's side of the family. My father had uh, a mild heart attack back in 2010, which is why I came down this path. He had also played for um, County Down back in the day, and had never really put on weight. He'd always sailed through the fitness test that they give him. And uh, yet, now I see it, it's coming at me from, from both directions. So um you know i i just have to accept that that's my genetic lot in life and, and and that's my mission to uh to keep that score down and if you can regress it well and good but as you point out very succinctly in the movie if you can stop the rusting process you'll stop the problem that's it and you just need to know how so i guess then the big ask to people and it's funny i've been producing free material supported by david bobbitt and ihda for years now uh, and we never really have an ask but I guess that's the ask now that not just to watch it and enjoy it uh, but also particularly to help share it because that we've got a huge community around the world now uh, this is not a profit-making endeavor but it still needs support so perhaps if people could just make that extra effort to share widely and, and recommend as they see fit rather than simply watching and moving on and that's probably the key thing I'd, I'd be saying now. And the other thing is the corona. We don't want to get caught up in that. I'm doing separate podcasts on the data around that. But it is absolutely stunning that the blood glucose, insulin, diabetic type physiology, metabolic syndrome is featuring massively in the people most severely affected uh, or indeed the fatalities. 
I mean, it's just extraordinary. You talk about Pareto principle, 80, 20, 90, 10. And the very things that are causing that exposure to this virus uh, are the almost the exact same things that you need to resolve uh, to resolve cardiac progression and cardiac disease. Uh, and indeed the other modern chronic diseases. So it's interesting how all the uh, tendrils are coming together now, even a novel virus that's causing such trouble. They all go back to the common soil of what makes humans weaker and uh, more prone to disease, really, right? Yeah, what, one line that struck me in the, in the UK media, they referred to Boris Johnson, who obviously we wish a, a speedy recovery to, but they said that uh, he'd been admitted to ICU, but he had no underlying symptoms, although he was clinically obese. And that, that wording in, in the Times newspaper, the way it was worded, just it struck me that um, the suggestion is that it's, it's okay to be clinically obese. That's not an underlying symptom, but, um, but it is. You know, it's, it's not even underlying. It's, it's, it's right there in front of you. And what I, I think the, the, the tragedy of the, of the coronavirus, uh, you know, I think my, my uh, co-producer on The Big Flat Fix and co-author of Piopita, Dr. Asim Malhotra, nailed it in an interview he did with, with Sky News. And I, I think there needs to be a wake-up call for preventive health. And, and people, you know, you really need to put your best foot forward in terms of your metabolic health. And the way you do that is by taking some simple measures. And, and if you don't do that, and many won't, and many won't particularly care, that, that is freedom of choice. <laughs> um, but just having the knowledge available to you that you can give yourself a better shot at a longer, healthier life and a more robust system when it comes to meeting challenges such as, as Corona. And that's considered non-PC to say that, but I'm actually fed up hearing that because I meet people all the time who tell me you've lost weight. My weight hasn't changed since I was an international athlete. Everybody else gets bigger. So, but you're not allowed to say to someone, oh, you've put on a few pounds. You know, maybe, maybe you want to watch the sugar on the cornflakes or the cornflakes themselves. That's not PC, but people will turn around and say, oh, you've lost weight. Are you okay? And I'm like, I haven't. I'm the same. So society, advertising, marketing has normalized, um, you know, this, this concept that people who are, strictly speaking, overweight or obese are, are perfectly fine and that's okay. And I'm not okay with that. And I come from a marketing background and I know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. The public doesn't because all they're doing is mirroring the average person in adverts. And, uh, you know, that's a big problem and it's it's a whole other discussion but it's a particular bugbear of mine yeah i agree with you and you know the irony as well is there's another side to it that by calling out this challenge a metabolic disease and yeah obesity flags it very powerfully but also we got tofies who are not apparently overweight but they still have the disease and the bad food uh, but it's not really the people's fault and i often used to say this over the years if someone sits and drinks coke and eats pizzas all evening watching television and never exercises, okay, they've made a choice. But for many people, they don't know what healthy eating is. So the simple fact that focus on meat, fish, eggs, all of avocado, and vegetables that are non-starchy, you know, a healthy, nutrient-dense, low-carb type diet, um, that simple message is not available to people. So the people who are eating all the bread and pasta and healthy whole grains and getting fatter and fatter, you know, it, they, they don't understand what the rules are. So you can't fully blame them when they become overweight and struggle. Uh, but yeah, it, it needs to be called out now. And ideally, both the problem, because there's an ostrich syndrome all over the place, even during this corona, people are trying to kind of deny the reality of who's most affected. But not just hopefully that we can focus on this properly because it's so important, but that we can begin to get the message out on what the actual fixes are and what the real good foods are and what the bad foods are. Because right now, 95% of people don't know up from down. I mean, butter's good, butter's bad, fat's good, fat's bad, meat's good, meat causes cancer. You know, healthy whole grains are good. Hold on a minute, whole grains are for horses. And it even makes some of those diabetic, I found out from a vet recently. 
you know, it, it's a crazy situation. But yeah, as you say, Donald, it's a different story. And we'll be talking about that stuff again, no doubt. Anyway, it's all about extra time. And let, let's hope the, the yeah. movie can win some people a little bit of extra time during the years. And it, it's, it's one small piece of the puzzle. But uh, thanks again to yourself and IHDA for joining me on this one. And I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing what people think about it. Excellent, Donalds. Thanks so much to yourself for creating it. And of course, IHDA and David for, for supporting this. What I think is a fantastic production. And we'll just close with, if you can help share, get it out there. That's what it's all about. We can't do anything without the, uh, without the network. So thanks, everyone. Good luck, Donald. Cheers, Ivor. Thanks for tuning in guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen and go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.